Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I am Grigory Giudoni. I thank you for joining and, uh, and I thank you for allowing me to be part of your day. We're going to go on a journey and that journey will be that of uh, attempting to think about performing uh, a shoulder orthogram without actually doing it. So all we are going to do is talk about it and you will notice some bias that is toward the way I do things. During the next 20 minutes or so, I will focus on talking about the direct method of injecting the glenohumeral joint. I will make a mention of the indirect method of orthography and really concentrate on the direct method, whether it be by anterior approach or posterior approach for horoscopy and sonography. And of course, I will highlight what mixture we use at the University of Rochester. Nowadays, orthography is done for the purpose of MR evaluation. A request is usually done for traumatic or atraumatic cause of pain, and the American College of Radiology has given us appropriateness criteria. I put in yellow the weakest criteria, so the ones that may be appropriate. The majority uh, in white are usually appropriate, of which the preponderance is for suspicion of liberal tear or suspicion of rotator cuff tear. I will not touch on CT or conventional orthography. The crux of the matter for shoulder orthography is twofold. One, to deliver contrast within the glenohumeral joint, and two, to adequately distend the glenohumeral joint. The indirect method may be preferred by patients because it involves an intravenous injection. As such, it is less invasive than the direct method. And the contrast is injected weight-based, similar to the pattern of uh, injection for other matters. However, imaging has to be carried at least 30 minutes after injection. The reason for this and the frustration that we may get with the indirect method is number one, there needs to be a pre-existing effusion in the joint in question. And number two, there must be some degree of inflammation going on at that joint. Why is that? It's because the intravenous gadolinium must diffuse into the glenohumeral joint. Um, and the hyperemia occurring at the joint facilitates that process. And the pre-existing effusion is what is responsible for uh, the distinction that we observe for indirect orthography. For the direct method, we can approach the joint anteriorly or posteriorly. Borrowing an image from Longu and colleagues, I am demonstrating the known Schneider technique and the approach also for the rotator interval. So the picture in A um, shows us that for the Schneider technique indicated by C, we are traversing the subscapularis tendon before reaching the joint. For the rotator interval technique, the region demarcated here, illustrated by B, our needle passes through the deltoid muscle and then immediately enters the glenohumeral joint after passing through the capsule. In terms of patient positioning, the patient will be supine. Um, I would advise that we do it supine. Um, some patients have a tendency to want to faint at the side of the needle. Other patients may legitimately have a vasovagal reaction. Uh, and it's not the time to negotiate patient positioning when this is occurring. With the patient already on the horizontal, it is not an issue. Now, we usually ask the patient to have the palm up. So in other words, supinate the hand. I would like to attract your attention that it is preferable to focus, that, to focus on the fact that the humerus is externally rotated. So in other words, think of it as elbow supination. In the image to the left, 
we have an internally rotated humeral head. This is a no-no for arthrography. On the image to the right, we have an externally rotated humeral head. Now, I know that we've heard uh, a discussion about anatomy from Dr. Manu. We will revisit what we heard very quickly and focus on what is relevant to us for the purpose of passing our needle into the glenohumeral joint. The osseous anatomy we've heard already is the scapula, particularly the glenoid portion of the scapula and the humeral head. I will also have you pay attention to the coracoid process uh, because in some patients, which I will illustrate here, not present there, the coracoid process, if it is elongated or hypertrophy, may project onto your intended area of needle passage. So it is important to pay attention to that. <clears throat> we should pay attention to the physial scar, um, which is along the anatomical neck of the humerus that delineates the uh, capsular attachment. Then we need to imagine the placement, the position of the subscapularis muscle, that of the supraspinatus muscle. This leaves us with the potential space of the joint, starting with the bicipital sheath, the subcoracoid or subscapularis recess, and the axillary recess. That leaves us with the area highlighted in red, which is our target. So pre-injection, when we look at our fluoroscopic image, we can already decide that this is where I want to place my needle. Now, I will illustrate again the position of the hand. If you pay attention here, notice the patient will supinate the hand. However, the elbow will not move. So that is not good. What we want to achieve is on the right, where we ask the patient to spin it fully, and now the elbow is facing forward. That is what we want to achieve. Those are two fluoroscopic images using the rotator interval approach. We note here that contrast has flowed away from the tip of the needle. We will come back on this later. Again, a quick revision of what we've seen so far, rotator interval versus Schneider technique. For the rotator interval, the needle passes through the deltoid, then immediately enters the joint capsule. This is an MR depiction of the pictogram. This would be the trajectory of the needle. This is the sagittal corresponding to the actual slice that we have. This would be the trajectory of the needle. And for the Schneider technique, after passing through the deltoid muscle, our needle needs to negotiate the subscapularis tendon before entering the glenohumeral joint and before we make a valiant attempt at lodging it between the articular surface of the humerus and that of the on the sonography, we use the same position as illustrated for fluoroscopy um, with the uh, following uh, uh, mentions. We need to pay attention on that view. This is a transversely oriented image um, of the shoulder anteriorly, the echogenic shadow of the coracoid is visualized, same as we would for MRI. We also see the echogenic shadow of the humeral head. Notice we have the same appearance for MRI. We recognize as well the fibrillary pattern of the biceps tendon, similar to MRI. And the red dotted line demonstrates to us the path of the needle. For here, I would like to mention that we want to reach the medial most portion of the echogenic shadow of the humeral head. So in other words, this is the area that we target on the uh, sonogram. This is the way we perform shoulder orthography on the sonogram at the University of Rochester after agreeing with Nithling, Dutrois, and De Villiers that this is indeed an easily achievable technique. Now, how do we do this? Transversely oriented probe, moving proximal on the arm and sliding medially. The corresponding image on sonography will be as follows. Oh. 
we will see very soon the shadow of the shaft of the humerus as we move proximally we encounter the bicycle groove i'm sorry for my jittery video and once we reach the biceps tendon we slide medially until we find the echogenic shadow of the coracoid our target is already in place. Once we are in place, we mark the position of the probe, the proximal end of the probe is marked as such, the distal end of the probe is marked as such, and the important thing to mark is the central position of the probe, which corresponded to the dotted line that we saw on the screen. This will indicate our needle placement. So this space right here is the rotator interval and the line indicates the preferred position of the needle. So we can place our needle anywhere along that line within those two lines. The posterior approach is not performed at our institution under fluoroscopy. So I had to use the wisdom of Rutten and colleagues um, to tell you that under fluoroscopy, the inferomedial aspect of the humor head is targeted, whereas under sonography, the central medial aspect of the humor head is targeted. The posterior approach may come in handy if the, uh, there is suspected pathology at the anterior aspect of the shoulder and we do not want to cause further iatrogenic injury to the anterior, anterior shoulder, uh, or if we fear that we may fail in our injection using an anterior approach. So those are uh, uh, two images of posterior approach done at our institution. To the left, the freehand technique, we can see the shadow of the needle being, having been advanced between the posterior labrum and the humoral head. On the right, we have also another posterior approach, this time from medial to lateral using uh, a needle guide. Both approach have been used with some degree of success at our institution. This is uh, again images of the posterior approach prior to injection on the left and post-injection on the right where we have achieved distension of the joint. But let me tell you that because fluid will preferentially go to the dependent portion of the joints, of any joint of the joint, we do not always see distension of the capsule. So much so, we will see this image later, when we have that degree of capsular distension, we may feel very happy uh, because it, it confirms to us that we have been in the joint. However, uh, this may be a, a sign of things to come and we'll see that later. In terms of contrast mixture, some authors advocate a one to 100 uh, gadolinium concentration. At our institution, we go with a one to 200 gadolinium concentration. In other words, we put 0.1 cc of gadolinium into a 20 cc of solution. The um, size of the syringe used for the gadolinium mixture is a 20 cc syringe. Under fluoroscopy, we have 15 cc of saline mixed with five cc of iodine, so we can see the injectate under fluoroscopy. Under sonography, we forego, of course, the iodine. It is um, good to test the intra-articular location of the needle tip prior to injecting the gadolinium mixture. This is achieved with a one-to-one -one mixture of iodine and lidocaine, or you could choose iodine and normal saline. We use uh, lidocaine in our institution. Uh, we, we train a, a lot of residents and fellows. Um, this is just in case if they are out at least we have the satisfaction of knowing some numbing, numbing medication was also there, right, uh, for the patient. On the sonography, uh, the test injection is five cc's of uh, lidocaine, and I preferentially use a five cc syringe for that purpose. 
The tools are at our disposition is of course the needle, the syringes and other um, things. Some people use a 21 gauge needle. Um, we've come to use a 22 gauge needle because this is better tolerated by the patient, uh, a happy patient um, than a satisfied physician. However, I will tell you that the field of injection, right? There is more resistance to injection using a um, smaller needle or a higher gauge needle than it is to use a larger needle or lower gauge needle. In essence, this is our setup. Um, because we uh, are an institution, um, it is actually financially beneficial to the institution to have things piecemeal rather than ordering the orthogram tray. Everything is set up for us by our technologists. For fluoroscopy, we use a penicillin drape. For sonography, we preferentially use surgical towels. Now, how much to inject? You may have your preference. Um, I will talk to you about our preference. Um, our preference is to limit the total distension volume to 12 cc's. This means if we estimate that we've given two cc's of test solution within the glenohumeral joint, then we follow this by 10 cc's of our gadolinium mixture. If during the process of injection on the fluoroscopy, we notice that the patient has a rotator cuff tear. So in other words, we notice that the contrast spills into the subacromial or subdeltoid bursa, we go ahead and inject more because we have to remember um, our second model that which is we want to achieve adequate distension of the joint because we may have other things that we want to evaluate as well, such as the lab labrum and ligaments. I would like at this point to share a few pearls with you in terms of antiseptics, whether you use betadine, also known as povidone iodine or chloroprep, also known as chlorexidine gluconate. Um, we should remember that this solution on the skin needs to be dry to be most effective. I know sometimes we are impatient, we put on the solution and we take another gauze and we wipe it off. This is to be avoided uh, if we can. So how do I cure my impatience? Well, cleaning the patient is what I do first. And then I shift my attention to preparing my gadolinium mixture. Now, you may ask me, if the patient is clean, then how do you mark? Well, I've resolved this quite uh, easily. Um, I have a, at my, we have at our disposition syringes, syringe caps, which are sterile on our table. So when I'm ready um, to uh, mark, I take the sterile, sterile syringe with the needle that is capped and place to identify the area and I put the tip of the cap on the site. I apply pressure. This is after an article which I read a few years back and I couldn't no longer find that reference. But you can try it on your own. If you take a, a clicker pen with the, uh, um, the writing portion retracted within the pen and you press on your skin and you count to 10, um, I will guarantee you that you will observe that the mark will remain for the next two, three, four or more slides of this presentation. So it's ample time um, for the mark to be visible um, um, while we are placing the penicillin drip and we numb the patient. But you probably may have at your disposition a uh, sterile uh, ink marker. Now, the mark, whether it be done for fluoroscopy or for the anterior approach on the ultrasound using the rotator interval that I described earlier, it is placed to, for a vertical course of the needle. And the needle should be driven vertically all the way in up until resistance is uh, reached or up until the needle can no longer advance because we have marked to reach the surface of the humeral head. more pearls uh, in the last uh, seconds left. Um, uh, we use uh, intermittent fluoroscopy to capture the injection early uh, at mid-filling and also at late-filling. This allows us to 
do some quick readjustment in case the needle has become dislodged during the injection. Our injection is uh, good if the contrast flows away from the tip of the needle. If the contrast pulls at the tip of the needle, it is an indication that you are not intra-articular um, and that the needle needs to be readjusted. Um, whatever you do, um, when you are about to inject, you must make sure that your system does not contain bubbles of gas or bubbles of air. Um, you may notice that during the preparation, some bubbles cling to the wall. It just takes a flicking of the syringe uh, to dislodge them and push those out. The ones that are stubborn will hopefully remain cling to the wall while you're injecting. So in summary, um, we have um, talked about how to perform shoulder orthography. It is a procedure that we can do with confidence using aseptic technique under intermittent sclerotoscopy or sonography using my preference, the anterior approach via the rotator interval. And uh, um, we should avoid to over distend the joint or to inadvertently introduce air. I thank you for your attention.